things. So uh, hi everyone for another installment of uh, TCS Plus, the original online seminar in theoretical computer science committed to the carbon-free dissemination of ideas across the globe since 2013. Um, so today we're uh, lucky to have uh, Jess Sorrell from uh, UCSD, uh, done uh, great work on uh, cryptography and uh, fairness and uh, uh, reproducibility as she'll tell us about uh, today. Uh, before I start, let me maybe uh, say a, a couple uh, uh, brief uh, announcements, uh, starting with a uh, kind of, uh, shout out to the rest of the organizers of TCS Plus, Clement Canon, Rachel Cummings, Anindya De, Sumega Garg, Gautam Kamat, Ilya Rosenstein, Odil Dregev, Slil Shram, Noah Stevens Davidovitz, Thomas Vidik, and Eric Weingarten. Uh, let me also mention, uh, in a couple of weeks, we have a talk by Rasmus King from uh, ETH Zurich, who will tell us about near linear time, uh, max flow and min cost flow. Uh, but today, as uh, promised, we have uh, Jess Sorrell from UCSD, who's gonna tell us about reproducibility and learning. Really looking forward to this. Uh, Jess, the floor is all yours. Thanks. Um, and again, I apologize for connection issues. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much, David. I'm gonna be talking about joint work with Russell, Rex, and Tony today on reproducibility and learning. Uh, okay, um, we've already... Sorry, um, already well, if you click having. On, if you click on the screen uh, when you're in uh, advanced uh, view. You have to. Yeah, there you go. Okay, cool. Um, great. So uh, first, let's talk about what we mean informally by reproducibility and why uh, we think it's important. So here's a little caricature of the scientific process. Um, definitely a caricature, uh, but uh, you can see it features guinea pigs. So a, a researcher has a hypothesis maybe they'd like to test. Let's say it's to see whether drug A is an effective treatment for disease B. Um, and they'll design and execute uh, an experiment to you know, make some sort of empirical observations of the effect of drug A on disease B, and then perform statistical inference from the resulting data to make conclusions about the original hypothesis. Um, and finally, report these findings to the, the broader scientific community. Now, ideally, published scientific findings actually capture some sort of enduring real world phenomenon. Uh, so in our example, if the scientists report that drug A uh, does have a significant effect on disease B, this effect should be reproducible. Um, it should be the case that if another team of scientists came along and were to follow the same experimental procedure, collected their own data, uh, they would be able to uh, obtain the same results. And this is very informally um, what we mean by, by reproducibility. Um, but as many of you are likely aware, not all is well with reproducibility in the sciences. So um, a 2016 survey published in Nature showed that uh, most scientists from the disciplines they surveyed, and it's quite a few, chemistry, biology, physics, medicine, earth uh, sciences, um, but some, many of these scientists had failed to reproduce published results, and some had even failed to reproduce their own experimental results, right? These are it's like more than 50% of scientists that have failed to, uh, to reproduce experimental results here. Uh, so in concerns regarding reproducibility extend to the computational sciences as well. Um, this is reflected both in the literature and at major conferences. Um, for instance, like uh, iClear has started holding workshops, various conferences have started holding competitions um, or like publishing best practices to promote reproducibility for, for submitted work. Um, so there's the question of like why this is even an issue in machine learning, right? We're writing algorithms. These things are, uh, you know, in, in some sense deterministic. Um, so so what's going on? Like why do why would uh, you know machine learning algorithms fail to to replicate? Um, and and one, one obstacle is simply tracking and reporting all of the randomness and hyperparameters used during training of a machine learning model, right? Um, so the initial weights in, uh, of nodes in a neural network, for example, are chosen randomly and will affect the results of training. Um, the question is, like, well, is the code open source, right? There are lots of times there are an algorithm, it's, or the implementation of an algorithm is you know, considered intellectual property and, and not open sourced. And so someone else can't necessarily um, you know, run this code independently. Um, disparate access to computing resources. So, you know, a small university research group is not gonna be able to, to purchase the same amount of computing power that say, you know, like Google Brain can. Um, it's just, you know, not gonna be feasible. They're not gonna be able to reproduce uh, the same sort of models that, that these large um, private research organizations can, can produce. Um, 
Another issue is proprietary or closed off data sets. So if, if a research group at Facebook or Google say, um, like maybe in a medical center, trains a model on customer or patient data, there are very legitimate privacy concerns that may prevent researchers from making their data sets public. And you know, therefore another research group can't necessarily uh, replicate results. Uh, another question from my account, that's just a statistical fluke in training data. Um, so you know, we're going to try to make con uh, conclusions about populations using samples from these populations. And maybe we just get lucky in some sense or very, very unlucky. And we end up concluding something that doesn't actually bear up under uh, resampling. So, so what do we do about this, right? So we know that replication is a serious issue. We have, have uh, some ideas about what may cause an experimental results to, to fail to replicate. Um, but we don't have good formal definitions of reproducibility, just these sort of like informal expectations like, oh, well, if I follow your report, I should get the same thing. Um, and without clear definitions, we can't really have like a well-developed theory of, of reproducibility. Um, so uh, we're not going to, uh, in this talk, uh, address all of these concerns, right? So we're trying to like, carve off a little slice of this reproducibility issue um, that might start to address the last two bullet points here. So issues with resampling of data. Right, or like our access to data. Uh, so we introduce a new notion of reproducibility as an algorithmic property. Right, so we're going to say an algorithm A um, has the property of being reproducible. Uh, our notion specifically captures reproducibility for randomized algorithms under resampling. Um, informally, this requires that an algorithm should output the exact same result with high probability if its randomness is held fixed between the two runs, um, but its input data set is resampled from the same underlying distribution. Um, our definition is inspired by work on pseudo-deterministic algorithms, um, notably work by Grossman and Liu and Goldreich. Uh, and it's also independently studied uh, by a group of researchers at Google um, whom Badi Ghazi, uh, Ravi Kumar, and Hassan Manarangsi, um, and I believe that their their work um, they they call they have a similar notion. They call it pseudo global stability, um, and they they use it to get results for for user level privacy. Um, and this definition can be seen as a generalization of the global stability property that was introduced by uh, Mark Roy and Shai uh, to in, in sort of this this work um, characterizing uh, what's learnable with approximate differential privacy. So these are all the sort of uh, related works that we're currently aware of uh, that, were, that use a definition that's sort of similar uh, to, to ours here. So just cool. one, one quick question. Uh, this, the connection to pseudo-deterministic algorithms, right? We can think of maybe R as being uh, the empty string, and now we're thinking of S1 and S2 as being the random strings used on the same input. And this this uh, at this point kind of maps to- Yeah, yeah. So the pseudo-deterministic algorithms are saying for, for all X, Right, that um, it should be the case that most random strings give you the same output. Uh, yeah. output. Yeah. Um, so, 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 yeah, you can think of it as, um, you know, in a sense, kind of swapping what's, I mean, we're not universally quantifying over samples, um, but you can think of it as you know, we're swapping what's held fixed and what's randomized. Mm -hmm. um, notably, uh, in pseudo deterministic algorithms, the random strings, you know, something about the distribution. And here we don't really know, we're not making any guarantees. Um, about the distribution D. So D can be extremely poorly behaved. Um, we'll still be able to say something. Cool. Um, so I wanna give like a, maybe like a quick comprehension quiz because literally the rest of the talk is about this definition. <laughs> um, so does anybody wanna volunteer and say um, how you could design a reproducible algorithm for an arbitrary problem um, if I want, row to be equal to zero, and I don't care about utility. Um, Pick your favorite output, just always output whatever. Exactly, exactly. So the constant function satisfies this. It's going to be extremely reproducible. It will not be very useful, right? Um, OK, a little bit harder now. Uh, what if I don't want it to be the constant function? <laughs> That's my only requirement. It still doesn't have to be good, but it just needs to not be constant. What else can I do and still satisfy this definition? Takers. Okay, so I could output my randomness. So in this case, because I, and I sort of wanted to, to ask this to highlight the fact that we're we're fixing the randomness between these two runs. Okay, so in this case, I won't be um, constant. I'll just be constant once I fixed randomness. Cool. 
Great. So uh, before we move on and start talking about results for reproducible algorithms, are there any questions about the definition? Um, again, understanding. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any any questions people have because um, it will be important. <laughs> So just does this definition imply anything for adjacent distributions? Um, so when you say adjacent distributions, sorry, do you mean like close in some yeah, like notion of distance? Variation distance or favorite, or yeah. I mean because um, somehow the 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 point about the reproducibility uh, crisis. You could just say, you know, I'm, I'm trying to run this experiment. I'm going to take some, you know, maybe I, I'm running an experiment on people. I'll experiment on people, you know, in Mountain View. You'll experiment on people in San Diego. And maybe there's some, some properties of these, you know, similar-ish distributions, but not quite the same. Absolutely. So I think this is a really natural question. And I, I think the answer ought to be, yes, you get some guarantees for this, but we haven't gone down that path yet, but that's sort of like a natural like follow-up thing to look at. Um, in the meantime, one application of this definition could be um, cases where you're using synthetic data, right? Where like there actually is like a well sort of defined distribution that your that your data is then coming from that you can um, share. Uh, and also sort of giving you guarantees in the absence of access to data, right? Essentially just saying, okay, like I, I know Let's say if something like failed to replicate, that it's not because of sample, the sample, um, that I, I can sort of isolate uh, failures to reproduce, yeah, causes for failures of, of um, replication. Uh, there are some other applications to differential privacy, uh, but I'm uh, I don't really prepare to talk about those. But I guess you can also use it for for auditing. This is a, a more easily auditable property than differential privacy is in terms of query complexity. Um, and and so you kind of can get some similar guarantees um, while actually being able to check it uh, efficiently. Cool. Any other questions? Great. Then moving on. Um, so despite the, the strong guarantees of reproducibility, um, we can actually obtain efficient algorithms for a bunch of interesting problems. Um, uh, so in this talk, we're going to show efficient algorithms for uh, simulating statistical queries reproducibly, for identifying heavy hitters of a distribution, for computing approximate medians of distribution, and then if we have time, we'll talk about uh, pack learning of large margin half spaces, um, where their uh, efficient is arguable, so we are going to have a polynomial runtime and we are going to have polynomial sample complexity in the parameters you know and care about if you learn half spaces, but we are polynomial in D, the dimension of the half space. So I just wanna put that out up front in case we don't get to it. It'd be great if that weren't true. Um, there are private algorithms that don't have dimension on, on D in a large margin case. And we like to think that we should be able to, to match those. Um, cool, so, and we also do have matching uh, sample complexity lower bounds for statistical queries as well. So we know that uh, roughly speaking that the, our sample complexity for statistical queries is about the right. Right value. So let's get started um, by looking at our statistical query algorithm. Uh, so um, the statistical query model was introduced by Mike Kearns in, in 93 to um, try and capture and understand uh, the problem of, of pack learning under random classification noise. Uh, that's, uh, you know, we want to give a little bit of innovation, but it's honestly not going to be super relevant to, to how we're using them here. Um, the important thing to know is that in this model, our learning algorithm doesn't get direct access to labeled data. It's just going to get statistics of the data, right? So, um, you know, it can ask like what fraction of the, um, you know, distributions below some value, things like, things like this. Uh, so a query, a statistical query is going to be defined on some domain um, X uh, that's labeled with a, a zero one label, um, and it will have an output value. Um, so a real number in the interval zero one. And our statistical query oracle will, will answer um, with you know, the expectation of this query over the distribution do within some tolerance tau. And we can notably normally simulate these using um, just sample data, right? We can draw a sample from the distribution and then use our sample to um, empirically estimate the, the value of the query. Great, so how do we do this reproducibly? Right? so here, you know, we have the zero one 
interval. And let's say the expectation of our query on the distribution is, is indicated by this green dot here. So we can use a sample S1 to empirically estimate the, the value of the, uh, the query, expectation of the query. But this is like immediately not reproducible, right? If we get another sample, we get another um, another empirical estimate. And you know, assuming that we've we've picked our sample size large enough that we have uh, you know error tau with with good probability, then there's this like two tau region where we can expect our empirical estimates to lie, and we don't know which one we're going to get, so we're not reproducible. To fix this, um, we're going to start by uh, first chunking up the zero one interval, we're going to partition it into sub intervals of, of what's say alpha, starting from some offset um, that's of, of size less than alpha. And then with each sub interval, we're going to take the midpoint and of, of the, the sub interval and consider this a canonical representative for that sub interval. And so now uh, what our statistical query oracle is going to do is it's going to estimate, empirically estimate the value of the, um, the expectation of the query uh, using the sample. And then it's gonna say, okay, well, what interval did I land in? Let me return the midpoint of that interval. Um, so in this case here that we've drawn out, um, both sample S1 and sample S2 uh, will map to answers, or map to the answer P4 um, because they're both in the same sub interval. But wait, what happens if the expectation of our query is like right on the boundary? Of an interval, right? Then we're back in the, the same um, problem, back at the same problem we had before, where some samples are going to give us an underestimate, some samples are going to give us an overestimate, and then we'll be in two different um, sub intervals and we'll return two different values. We won't be reproducible. So, what do we do about this? Um, we're going to use our randomness, right? Because so far we haven't used our random string. And this random string is going to select for us the starting offset, right? So, remember, we didn't start at exactly um, zero, we, we picked a sort of random, random off, or we picked an offset, and now we're going to randomize this offset. <clears throat> so we can see that different um, random strings will map to different offsets, will map to different boundaries. Um, and then some of these boundaries will be good for uh, reproducibility, right? Um, well, you know, they, it'll be the case that all reasonable estimates of um, the quantity that we care about will lie within one interval, and some will be bad, like this one here. On the slide. Um, importantly, if we're estimating our uh, the, the value of our uh, statistical query to within tolerance, let's say tau zero, um, then we're going to uh, be we're going to fail to reproduce um, anytime we sort of we have a boundary right that, that lands within this um, two tau zero interval, and so our oracle will be. Uh, two tau zero over alpha reproducible because alpha is the width of these intervals. Um, and then there's a, a two tau zero region um, of, of the interval that's bad for us, right? So that's going to be our reproducibility parameter. Um, notably, we'll also be uh, theta of alpha accurate because when we return the midpoint, we can potentially perturb the, the value of our estimate by alpha over two. Right? If we were like at the edge of the interval and then we, we yanked our answer over to the middle of the interval, then um, we changed it by something of order alpha. So if we if we estimate uh, the value of our uh, statistical query to within tolerance, it's about uh, our target reproducibility parameter times our target accuracy parameter, then this suffices uh, to give a reproducible tau accurate statistical query oracle. And then we can do this you know, uh, with sample complexity uh, inverse quadratic in these these parameters. Great, so um, that's sort of the, the rough theorem for reproducible statistical queries. We have tolerance tau. Um, I, I've sort of been neglecting failure probability, but there'll always be some sort of probability of failure here. Um, and then reproducibility failure parameter rho, um, and then we'll end up with a final sample complexity. Um, that's you know about what we just talked about. We have this log one over delta um, times the accuracy and reproducibility squared. Great, so any questions about the reproducible statistical queries? Um, this is really like our one weird trick, this sort of randomized rounding thing <laughs> to canonical representatives. Um, is there, it's very much like the one weird trick from which all of our, uh, it is the heart of all of our technical results or the foundation at least. So if there are any questions about how or why this works, um, again, best to ask them now because we're just gonna be building on this. Cool. 
So let's move on to heavy hitters. All right, so what is a heavy hitter? We'll say that, um, well, first of all, we'll let D be a distribution over some domain X. And we'll say that an element X from this domain is a V heavy hitter of our distribution. Um, if D assigns um, probability at least V to X. Why would, okay, so I guess we have an example here. So in this case, let's say we care about um, one fourth heavy hitters. Uh, for our distribution represented by the histogram, then X4 and X5 will be uh, V heavy hitters and the rest of the elements will, will not be. All right, so why would we ever care about finding these things? Um, and, and they're useful in uh, questions related to search engines or recommender systems if you want to find like frequently searched for, um, frequently like listened to or purchased items. Uh, and we show a, a reproducible algorithm for identifying heavy hitters of a distribution. Uh, we'll be finding approximate heavy hitters. So we'll find um, all elements that are within some range of V minus epsilon and V plus epsilon for specified um, inputs phi and epsilon. And this will take, uh, again, samples uh, that will be quadratic in the, the relevant parameters or inverse quadratic in the relevant parameters. So again, we have this one over row squared um, dependence from, from reproducibility. Uh, so for the sake of time, I'm maybe gonna go through this a little bit faster because we're using again, like very similar techniques to what we used for the statistical query Oracle. But the, the idea is, um, again, that we've seen this randomized rounding technique pretty straightforward. So we're gonna draw um, a one sample that's large enough that we can guarantee that like all uh, V heavy hitters of this distribution will actually be in that sample with high probability, right? So if there's a V heavy hitter, then we have a good probability of sampling it. So we're just gonna big, draw a big enough sample that they're all in there. Uh, then we're going to use a second sample uh, to estimate the probability that our distribution assigns to every element in our list, right? So we're in step number one, we're sort of generating this list of candidate heavy hitters. Um, and step number two, we're um, using some additional examples to, to estimate the actual probability of all of these candidates um, to within um, some desired accuracy. Uh, now, again, here's where the randomness comes in. We're going to pick some V prime uniformly in the interval V minus epsilon and V plus epsilon. So again, we're not gonna come away with um, exact V heavy hitters here. We're gonna have something close to V heavy hitters. Um, and now we're going to remove from um, our list of candidates, any sample X or any example X um, where the estimated probability falls below this V prime. So why are we randomizing V here? Uh, and this is, again, because we want to avoid the case where like maybe the true probability of some element, element is right on the threshold of V, right? Maybe it's exactly V. And so some estimates will say, oh, it's actually like V minus, you know, like a 10th. And some will say it's, oh, it's V plus one eighth. And we, we want it by randomizing the exact value of V that we're looking for um, by picking this V prime uniformly at random from some interval, we can then bound the failure of reproducibility by saying, oh, well, there's some probability that we don't actually hit this little region around the true probability that, that encompasses all of the likely estimates of the probability. So that's heavy hitters. Right, and then we're gonna return the elements that we didn't remove from our candidate list. And um, they should all be in there with high probability. So uh, now that we have heavy hitters, we can move on to the approximate median problem, which is gonna be our, I think our most fun algorithm that we'll get to go over today. Uh, so let's define the problem first of all. So we'll say that X in uh, element X in domain X is a tau approximate median of D. Uh, if it's the case that the probability um, under D of an element being less than or equal to X is at least a half minus tau, and the probability of an element being greater than or equal to x is at least a half minus tau. Uh, so why do we care about this problem, right? I mean, medians are like a pretty fundamental statistical quantity, so we would like to be able to compute them, but they also let us generically convert a non-reproducible algorithm into a reproducible one, um, as long as this algorithm outputs a real value. That's going to be important. So how does this work? Uh, 
so equipped with our reproducible median algorithm and uh, some other algorithm for uh, for a problem that you know has answers in, in real values, we can run A repeatedly on multiple different independent samples from our distribution. Um, so each time A gives us a, a real number output, and then we'll use these outputs uh, from A, from the, the repeated runs, as a sample to feed to our reproducible median algorithm, right? So you can think of what we're doing here as generating a sample from the distribution of outputs of A, right? And then we want to find a median reproducibly from the distribution of outputs of A. Um, and, and so this will yeah, give us a, a reproducible algorithm. We have to be a little bit careful about preserving utility here, um, but, but this is doable. So let's get into it. If you're familiar already with the privacy literature, we're going to use a technique that's um, pretty similar uh, in, I guess, a like conceptual flavor to techniques used um, by Bun, Nissen, Stemmer, and Vedan to show uh, approximate differentially private algorithms for interior point uh, slash median slash thresholds. Um, and there was follow up work getting um, improved sample complexity by Kaplan, um, Lidget, Mensor, Nauer, and Stemmer. Uh, our techniques are probably a little bit closer to the uh, or to the original work. But again, their, their techniques are sort of similar too. So uh, we bear a resemblance to both. And to make things a little bit simpler, um, unfortunately not significantly simpler, but a little bit simpler, we're gonna just say tau is 1 16th <laughs> for the rest of this talk. Okay. So uh, again, we're gonna have some sort of data domain X and we're gonna say, you know, we can represent any domain we like really is as binary strings of, of some length D. And so we'll just assume that X is um, the, the domain is a binary strings of length D. And um, we're going to consider uh, a new distribution, D prime, which is generated by running uh, a median algorithm, uh, a, a tau approximate median algorithm for D. Okay, so this isn't a reproducible algorithm, right? We're not creating a reproducible approximate median algorithm by assuming we have one, we're, but we are generating a new distribution um, by repeatedly running a non-reproducible approximate median algorithm on, on samples from our original distribution. So uh, this distribution over medians is, is going to be called D prime. And note that it's sufficient to reproducibly return um, a 3 8 approximate median for D prime, right? So if we have some sort of distribution over uh, tau medians, then if we return a median of, of this distribution, then um, we'll have we'll have a, a tau median. Uh, we're going through these steps because there's it's sort of hard to get the taus to match up, right? Ideally, we'd like to be able to reduce the problem of finding a tau approximate median in one distribution to finding a tau approximate median in the other. Uh, it's a little bit tricky to do that, and so we have this intermediate distribution D prime that lets us um, translate between uh, between the two. Great. Um, so let us imagine the following binary tree. Uh, we will have leaves that um, have labels representing elements of the domain X. So um, for every every element in the domain, there is there is a leaf, and uh, we'll have internal nodes representing prefixes of these elements, right? So and um, you know here we. We start with a prefix of length zero, um, no prefix of length one. Well, there are you know two possible prefixes of of length one, and so on and so forth down the tree. Um, and we'll assign each node a weight, uh, which is the probability under D prime, uh, not D, that uh, an element has um, a given prefix, right? So uh, here it's the you know the, the probability we we give this node weight. Um, according to the probability that an element sampled from D prime starts with one. So what we want to find is um, a one either, I guess a one quarter heavy hitter of D prime. Um, if it exists, we're not guaranteed that it does exist. Um, but if one exists, we want to find it. Um, or we want to find a prefix uh, S, uh, you know, some sort of node in this tree that has weight in between a quarter and three quarters. Okay. Um, so, so why is that? Why, how does that help us if we don't have a heavy hitter? So um, hopefully you see if we have a heavy hitter, we're, we're done. Because if we have a quarter heavy hitter, then we have 
um, this three eighth approximate median of D prime. And so we can just return that. But again, we don't know if such a thing exists. So the first thing we're going to do is run heavy hitters on like the sort of bottom layer, layer of our tree, see if it does exist, return it if we do, uh, if it does, and we're done. If it doesn't, we have to do something a little bit fancier um, and, and look for this prefix. But why, why do we care about the prefix? Um, we'll note that, okay, if we, if we have a prefix that has probability um, less than or equal to three quarters and at least one quarter under this distribution, um, then one of two things has to be the case. Either this prefix padded out the rest of the way um, to length D with zeros is going to be a three at approximate median or that prefix padded out with ones, right? So again, sort of imagine um, uh, this interval here representing um, it was sort of spanning from zero, 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 zero to, to one, 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 one. Um, S zero is this his first option here. S one is the second option. Um, and we know that uh, less than three quarters of the distribution of the mass of the distribution D prime is got to be in here because that's what we got from, from our prefix length, is what our prefix length told us. Um, so that means that there's a quarter of the distribution that has to go somewhere else, right? It has to go either above S one or below S zero. Um, and so there's got to be. Um, yeah, there's got to be like one eighth on at least one of these two sides. Okay, um, and so that means that we can then um, we then know that okay, one of if if there's at least one eighth on this side, then we can return s zero. We know that that's going to be um, a, a three eighths approximate median because we have um, you know that there's a lot of mass in here and some mass in here. If it's over here, then we know s one will will be a good approximate median again because we have a lower bound on the amount of probability mass in this region, and then we know that there's a um, a lower bound on the probability mass here as well. Okay, so, so we've reduced to either finding a heavy hitter of D prime or finding this magical prefix of length L. So how are we gonna find the magical prefix of length L? Um, Cause we know how to find heavy hitters. We just talked about that. Uh, so we're going to try and reduce to the problem of finding approximate median for a different distribution. And this distribution will be D double prime. I probably could have come up with better names. I apologize, but uh, so it goes. So how, what is the distribution D double prime here? Um, it's induced by sampling two elements from D prime and returning the length of the longest prefix on, what they, on which they agree. Okay. Um, so let's say X1 is like one, one, zero. X2 is one, zero, zero. Um, those would induce uh, element one, because they both agree on, on the first bit and then um, they stop agreeing. Okay, so, so D double prime is now going to be a distribution over prefix lengths, right? Um, so because it's distribution over prefix lengths, it's uh, supported on this domain uh, that has size that's like bounded above by log of the size of the original domain, right? Because we're now looking at lengths of the representation of elements from our original domain. Um, so that's pretty cool uh, that, that we're now trying to solve an approximate median problem on a much smaller domain than the one we started on. Um, and so, yeah, we need to make this reduction go through to, to actually be able to turn this sort of idea into a recursive algorithm. So let's say we had already a tau approximate median of this distribution D double prime over prefix lengths. Okay. So the definition of approximate median will give us um, this bound, right? So we know that we have a prefix length such that if we, um, the probability that two elements um, agree on a longer prefix length um, is at least a half minus tau, in this case, seven sixteenths. And uh, again, that, that they agree only on a shorter length, right? The longest prefix on which they agree um, that is a shorter one is, is also going to be greater than a half minus 10 or seven sixteenths. But for now, we're just going to care about this, uh, this lower bound for lengths. So I claim that uh, given that I have L, um, my, my recursive algorithm has given me a prefix length that's a tau approximate median. Um, I, I claim that there exists a node V at level L of my tree, um, such that either the node itself is the node we're looking for. It has weight in between a quarter and three quarters. In other words, it's like a, a very probable, but not too probable prefix under D prime, um, or it has a child, 
<laughs> such that that is true. So we're not actually guaranteed we can get a, a lower bound from the definition. Um, we can get this lower bound of a quarter for the weight from the definition of median. We can't quite get this upper bound though, but we then do know um, that one of the two children has to um, have weight upper bounded by, by three quarters. Um, so I'm gonna prove this claim really quick. Um, so again, the lower bound is just gonna follow e immediately from the, or not quite immediately, but it's gonna follow from the, the um, definition of tau median of, of D double prime. Uh, the next piece is um, also gonna follow from, you know, it's gonna be a little bit, a little bit, uh, it's gonna require a little bit more reasoning. So uh, if the node that uh, we know has, uh, has weight greater than a quarter uh, has, also has weight greater than three quarters, um, then both of his children has to have weight have to have weight lower than three quarters, right? So why is that? Because um, otherwise, uh, one of uh, so I guess like imagine that uh, one of the children did did have weight greater than three quarters. Uh, what does the weight mean? Well, the weight means that the probability. Um, that if we restrict an, um, an element from the distribution D prime to briefings of length L plus one, uh, that we get this, uh, that we get the label of this vertex, that probability is greater than three quarters, right? So what is this, like, how is this gonna give us a, a contradiction? Um, well, we said that um, the probability that, um, uh, It'll give us a contradiction for the following reason. It's going to say if there's a whole lot of probability mass on a longer prefix, right? If there's too much probability mass um, greater than three quarters, then that means that the probability of sampling, um, uh, probability, I guess, of, of uh, two elements drawn from D prime agreeing on a prefix that's longer than L, strictly longer than L, um, has got to be at least uh, nine sixteenths, right? Because we have probability three quarters of sampling this one element. So if we sample it twice, then it's definitely going to, you know, like a, a, a the prefix, I guess, that represented here is of length L plus one. And so we know that uh, we have probability nine sixteenths of, um, of elements agreeing on a, a, a prefix length strictly greater than, than L. Um, and this is going to contradict the fact that we said L was a tau approximate median of this distribution D double prime. Um, so, Great. Uh, so essentially, what uh, what this then means is that we we know that we have two different levels of the tree. Okay, so go back for a second. We have two different levels of the tree to look at. We have to look at L, but it's possible there's not actually this like magical node that we're looking for at level L. But we do know that it's got to be at level L plus one if it's not at level L. So um, we can run heavy hitters at, on two levels of the tree. That's fine. Cool. So um, we showed how to use just now, a, a tau approximate median for this distribution over prefix lengths uh, to find two possible levels of the tree to search for the node that, that we care about. Um, and again, we can use our reproducible heavy hitters algorithm um, to identify these nodes in a reproducible fashion by running them on the distribution um, D induced by sampling, um, I guess I should say like D prime here, but uh, from sampling from D prime and then just returning the first L bits. Um, and then again, on, if we don't find um, the node we're looking for at level L, then we run heavy hitters um, on the next level uh, by sampling from D prime and then just taking the first L plus one bits. Great, so now we um, can, can find heavy hitters uh, and then we can use our reproducible statistical query algorithm on the list of heavy hitters to weed out those heavy hitters that have too much weight. Uh, and again, this is all being done reproducibly. We've already shown how to do this in a reproducible fashion. Um, so we can reproducibly find V. And then you recall, we, we just said in a few, a few slides ago that once we find V, um, the label of V gives us this prefix that has a good probability under D prime. And then we can use that to, um, to figure out which of uh, S0 and S1 make for a good 38 approximate median of D prime. And we can return this. Um, and again, we can we can uh, do this reproducibly. We'll, we'll use statistical queries to figure out you know how much mass is less than S prime and how much mass of the, the distribution D prime is is greater than S one. Uh, I think it's S prime is S zero. 
Cool. All right. So after all of that, we will have in our pause a reproducible tau approximate median, which is what we set out to do. Uh, what sample complexity does this have? Um, so recall that uh, this distribution D prime, uh, on which we're recursively calling our algorithm, uh, is a distribution over prefix lengths and therefore has domain size less than log of our original domain size. And ultimately, this is going to give us a sample complexity that is exponential in log star of the size of the starting domain, right? So at each step that we recurse, um, we end up with a domain that's log of the, the previous um, side of the domain. And then log star rate is how many times I can iteratively call log before I get um, below one. And so that's how many recursive calls I'll be able to, to make. Um, and we end up with this, this exponential dependence, um, which is similar, uh, at least in terms of dependence on the domain size to um, the, the first uh, differentially private median algorithm that I mentioned. Um, the second work brought this dependence on uh, the domain size down to rather than exponential in log star, um, just like polynomial in log star, or very small polynomial. Um, I'd like to think that we should be able to to match that as well for a number of reasons, uh, but we we don't have that quite yet. We just we still have this uh, exponential dependence, but it's log star, so it's like four at most. Yes, can you say a few words cool. about where um, where the exponential dependence on log star uh, pops up? I mean, it's the the fact that we have log star uh, depth of the recur uh, recurrence is clear. I'm quite sure why, is it exponential? why is this is the, the sample complexity you get? Yeah, okay, so at, at each step, um, remember we have to, uh, so to like first generate this distribution D prime by running our median algorithm a whole bunch of times. And so essentially at each level to generate enough samples for the next level, we have to run like over, like one over tau squared ish. Uh, median algorithm uh, or rather what we need like for each for each individual sample we need something like one over tau squared to actually generate a sample um yeah for the next distribution because we have to yeah we need one over tau squared ish for uh the median great question cool um yeah we have time to to blow through learning half spaces i think we should be good okay so um, quick introduction, just like this. This is just going to be a, a, the setup for pack learning. So if you already know and love pack learning, feel free to tune out for a second. Um, uh, so we said that a concept class C um, is a, a set of functions from some domain X um, to uh, binary labels. Um, so F is just going to be some sort of like labeling function for elements from domain X. Um, and we'll use F to denote a function from a concept class. C. Uh, D will again denote some sort of unknown distribution, um, this time over labeled examples. Um, and we'll refer to the marginal distribution over D. That's just the, the distribution over, um, uh, over elements of X uh, as, as D sub X. Where in, and then the, the data points um, X are going to be labeled by this function F. So D is supported on um, these pairs like X and then F of X. We'll say that an algorithm A is a pack pointer for C. If for all epsilon delta, um, we have that it is probably uh, probably approximately correct. This is what pack stands for. So the um, the probably is um, saying that over most samples that we can give to our algorithm, we're going to get something useful. So um, we get something useful with probability one minus delta, and then the approximately is sort of defining what useful is. And, and so the approximately is saying that. Um, our, we're going to get uh, a hypothesis H, uh, the output of our algorithm A, uh, and it will agree with F of X um, with respect to our distribution, our marginal distribution over X, uh, for all but like a epsilon fraction um, of the probability mass of, of DX. Right, so we are approximately correct, um, probably. So that's that's our goal here. Um, and we want to pack learn uh, these things. We want to pack learn half spaces and specifically large margin half spaces. Um, so uh, half space in this case will just be, um, well, we want to learn functions that are um, parameterized 
by a vector defining some sort of hyperplane. Um, and this hyperplane like, is going to linearly separate our data into to positive and negative examples, right? So we're saying that there's, there's some sort of um, half space that we can use to classify our data. And the large margin assumption is saying that um, there's some sort of uh, like buffer are around this half space that there that no example is too close to the the border between positive and negative examples. Notably, it's it's easier to learn half spaces if we have this margin assumption than if we if we don't. Great. Um, so I'm not going to go into the the algorithm too much. So I'm happy to take questions on it if if people are very interested. Um, but we're able to reproducibly learn these large margin half spaces. Uh, by uh, following the boosting framework. Um, so what that means is we're going to first concoct a reproducible weak learner. Um, by a weak learner, I just mean um, something that's significantly worse than a, a pack learner. What we're going to get from A is a hypothesis that's not uh, approximately correct, but it's at least better than a coin flip. Um, so we have this weak learner, and then we're going to boost it um, using specifically Servetio's smooth boosting algorithm. Um, because this is at least the, the first boosting algorithm we were able to see how to, to uh, make reproducible. And so we have a, a reproducible uh, weak learner and a reproducible boosting algorithm that's querying this reproducible weak learner. And so the overall um, boosting algorithm will also be uh, reproducible and then can boost this weak learner to arbitrary accuracy. Uh, so Again, this is um, going to be polynomial, which is great, except for we're polynomial in the dimension of the half space. And typically this is considered to be um, large and, and our polynomial dependence isn't even very good. Uh, we sort of have two versions of our weak learner. Um, one is a fairly large uh, polynomial dependence on D and you can trade that off um, a very smaller polynomial dependence on D if you want to run an exponential time. <laughs> um, so you can take your pick of which of those two things is, is worse. Yes. Yeah. Uh, does the large margin assumption here kind of take the place of like the the random shifts we did in the statistical query place to like avoid this kind of some sort of border issue, or is this this is a separate thing? Oh uh, yeah. So if I'm um, oh, I'm getting the unstable message. Tell me to repeat myself if you if I am break up. But um, if I understand you correctly, that's that's pretty much it. So the issue is that um, again we're going to like want to discretize the output space um, for for like the um, the half spaces that we're outputting as weak hypotheses, and so we're going to have to round to canonical representatives um, of this discretized space, and we want to make sure that when we we round, um, we don't cross this. Uh, we, we don't like uh, that. We, so we have some margin uh, to to spare, right? So we're going to take something that's a um, an improvement to. Um, I guess in the boosting algorithm, we're building up um, a, a hypothesis by adding um, slightly better hypotheses, and we want to make sure that we're not adding something that's actually making us slightly worse <laughs> at each step. And um, so we need the margin to guarantee that we didn't go from a hypothesis that was like slightly good to something that was slightly bad. Great, thank you. Yeah. Cool. Um, I should probably stop fairly soon to take questions, but I do want to say a few things about uh, ongoing and future work. Uh, with <laughs> I, I can see see Max laughing as I picked this beautiful photo of him. Um, so this is we have ongoing work <laughs> with. Max Hopkins and um, everyone that you saw in the, the title slide. Uh, and some things that we're looking at ordered, I think, roughly in decreasing order of us knowing what we're talking about. Um, uh, no, sorry, the, the, the better algorithm should go at the very bottom then. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we, uh, this is just future work. We would like to come up with these better like median and half space algorithms that we think should exist because we have, um, we have them for differentially private algorithms um, using related techniques. Um, and we also have a, a rough idea of how to relate reproducibility to differential privacy, um, though there are still a bunch of open questions and all of this needs to be written down <laughs> um, and checked. But we we think uh, that it's, it's the case that a, a, um, reproducibility sits in between pure differential privacy and approximate differential privacy. 
Uh, we don't have an equivalence between any of these definitions yet, nor do we have separations. Um, again, nor do we have written down proofs for the bullet point here either. So this is all, you know, stuff that I'm excited about. So I wanted to mention, but um, tentative. Uh, and I'm also interested in uh, understanding what uh, we can pack learn reproducibly. Uh, and coming up with a reproducible parity algorithm, right? So we have this reproducible statistical query oracle, which means we can do reproducible statistical query algorithms, which captures actually like a whole lot of, of what we care about learning, uh, but notably doesn't capture parity. Um, so, so it'd be cool if we could also um, sort of like, you know, add in this piece of, of the learning puzzle and come up with a reproducible algorithm for, for parity. Um, and also reproducible hypothesis testing, right? So I started this whole talk um, by talking about the, you know, the uh, replication crisis in, in the sciences, but I actually haven't said much about like science broadly or statistical inference broadly, I've just sort of focused on, on problems that we look at in learning theory. Um, but I, I think that we should be able to do something with, you know, maybe like frequentist hypothesis testing where uh, we, we want to guarantee that we will uh, or I say we're, we're, what reproducibility would mean in this context is that we um, either uh, reject null or fail to reject null. Um, uh, you know, th that is, I guess, the decision that is reproducible, right? So we have a, this sort of statistical analysis set up, the bit reject or, um, or fail to reject, and we, we want this value to be reproducible over different samples to guarantee that, um, you know, when we, we publish scientific results, that it, again, we, we didn't um, just get lucky with some sort of statistical fluke, that uh, let us, you know, say the thing that we uh, wanted to say, or let us, you know, find something um, was statistically significant that isn't actually statistically significant. Great, that's all I have for you today, and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, lots of clapping emojis. Thanks, Jess, for a great talk. Uh, mm. let's uh, open up the floor for some questions. Happy to go first. Also happy to wait to see if anybody else wants to go first. Okay, uh, so let me maybe ask one kind of natural question, I think. So you'd, you'd uh, mentioned the question of uh, separations. If you could maybe go one, one slide back. I guess there's one question of separation between... Oh no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just critically failed going back a slide. Uh, no. This is fine. Um, so I guess. Sorry. Um, so one one natural question I think is: uh, Do you know any separation between reproducible and non-reproducible uh, algorithms for for any task? I mean, do you, do you need more samples? Uh, you know, maybe maybe a higher constant in the sample, maybe an asymptotically larger number of samples. Is this question clear? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think so. Um, I, I will attempt to answer the question. You can tell me if it's not the right question. Um, so we do have a lower bound on, um, uh, on in, on the reproducible statistical queries. So mm -hmm. we know that this inverse quadratic dependence on rho is necessary. Um, so that's sort of like the cost in terms of the reproducibility parameter, if that's if that's what you what you mean. And and the non-reproducible setting, like you can do this with like a single. Uh, I see. Row row doesn't even uh, factor in, right? Yeah. Um, I guess another uh, maybe maybe uh, yeah another example you might be interested in is that is we get um, I, again this is sort of conditioned on um, the our our tentative. DP results actually working out, um, but we can inherit the lower bounds on um, sample complexity in terms of like the domain size from um, differentially private median. So there's this yeah like log star um, dependence on the size of the domain that is necessary um, for for DP learning, and so we would be able to get um, something like like that. Saying okay, you have to have this dependence on the domain size to to do medians reproducibly. Got it. Okay, so there's one question in the chat. Uh, I can read this, or Sachet can unmute. Uh, oh, I think I can see it actually. So, um, can you say what you mean for reproducibility? Um, oh, okay. In between, is this a uh, Cool. Yes, 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 exactly. 
exactly. So um, yeah, so we would say that, okay, if you give me a pure DP algorithm, I can uh, not necessarily efficiently <laughs> give you a reproducible algorithm for the same problem. Um, and then uh, if you give me a reproducible algorithm um, using like very approximately at a high level, it can do like subsample and aggregate sorts of techniques to get an approximate um, DP algorithm for the, the same problem. Do you have any thoughts about the reproducible hypothesis testing? You said this is fairly down on the on the on the slide, and this should yeah. <laughs> this is still the most preliminary stages. Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, like one one thing that is silly, uh, but this is a thought that we had um, is you know, sort of using trying to use this this uh, approximate median algorithm um, to look at distributions over p values right so under the null hypothesis you would expect the your p values to be like uniformly distributed um and then under the alternate hypothesis question mark question mark question mark so maybe they're like some district right we can maybe make some sort of restrictions on um on kinds of hypothesis testing problems uh where we we know that we'd be able to to use our reproducible median algorithm to uh, output the same answer with high probability. But again, this is like very hazy, very far down on the we know what we're talking about list. Any other questions from the audience? Going once, going twice, going thrice. Oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> Um, such as was ask, asking, what are the implications of bullet two on pack learning under DP versus reproducibility? Okay. Um, uh, sorry, when you say under DP versus reproducibility, do you mean how does that like how does bullet three bear on bullet two, or do you just are you just using that to index bullet three? Um, because we use bullet three in bullet two, I guess is what I was asking. So I'm curious if you anticipate that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think I haven't, yeah. Can you um, maybe paraphrase the, the question? Uh, such a uh, if you have if you have a mic on your computer maybe feel free to unmute yourself that might be a bit uh, easier to have interactive communication hello can you hear me sorry yep. right so um okay so maybe i'm misunderstanding bullet two but does that mean so you can take a pure dp algorithm and compile it into a reproducible algorithm but so that may have a big blow up in sample complexity or? Um, um, yeah, I, I think the, the main concern is also uh, efficiency, like computational uh, efficiency, because that is not. <laughs> um, okay. uh, so if you have like a pure DP pack learning algorithm, can you compile that into a reproducible pack learning algorithm? I'm sorry, if you have a, a pure DP pack learner, can you compile it into a reproducible? Yes. Yes. Or, or sorry, I should say, we think so. <laughs> we don't know. I think. Um, but and, if we reproducible, and if you have a reproducible pack learner, you can compile that into an approximate DP pack learner. Yes, again. But that yes. means if you have a pure DP pack learner, you can compile that into an approximate DP pack learner, right? But there are like separations between pure DP well, and approximate. Uh, so the, the arrows are going in the right direction for that, though, right? Because pure DP is automatically a prox DP, but the other direction I is the one. That yeah. So, so yeah, pure DP is just a, a prox DP with with delta equals zero. Oh, got it. So, is there um, so is there a separation in the second implication? I'm sorry. That you know, is there like a separation in the second implication? Is it possible that reproducibility is in fact equivalent to approximate DP? Yeah. So we don't we don't know. I think that'd be really cool to find out. Like if it's yeah, <laughs> it's like it. it I think it. Okay. any resolution to this would be cool in my mind. <laughs> Um, like if it's okay, truly intermediate, it. that's, I think, maybe my favorite possible outcome, um, just because that seems silly. Because like, if you're deep, right? I mean, it's like differential privacy is this like worst case notion 
um, that applies to right like all data sets and then reproducibility is this average cache notion that only applies to like in distribution samples. Um, and if it was like truly somehow nestled between these two that'd be cool, um, but also it's, it's possible that it's just equivalent to to one or the other, my guess would be a pro like if, you, if I had to guess, I would say that if it's going to be equivalent to one or the other, it would be approximate DP. Um, but we don't know we don't have separations between pure DP and reproducibility we don't have separation yeah. Okay, and this is equivalent to like a separation between, so like global stability is equal to approximate DP, right? So this is like a separation in reproducibility parameters. Is that fair to say? Um, yeah, I think I think that's that's uh, if I if I again if I understand you correctly, um, like it's yeah it's not known that global right. So I mean again like the arrows are going in the right way for us here. So um, we're kind of like pseudo global stability, right? Um, we are like a generalization of global stability because we allow like this this randomness to affect things. So a uh, reproducible algorithm is automatically globally stable, but not the other direction. And so um, again, that's like another thing where like okay, maybe we can find a separation or, or equivalence there. But um, what's known is currently compatible with the direction zeros are going. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. When you do this. Uh like this reproducibility or uh, this DP to reproducibility conversion is is privacy maintained or is there a way to do it where privacy is maintained? Uh, that's a great question. I don't, I have not thought about that. And of the people on the Zoom call, Max might be <laughs> a better person to ask that I think no. Okay. Gotcha. Um, So I think that question ties into what I asked earlier on when you define the reproducibility, right? I mean, this is basically saying, can you have something kind of like reproducibility for similar distributions? Maybe, I don't, I don't know if, if, if you see how this. Um, I don't, but that's neat. Wait, can you, yeah, can you elaborate? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, if you have, reproducibility and privacy is this not in some sense uh, going to tell you you know you're saying oh oh, oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. sorry you're you're like, of the oh, error for uh for you know one for for the yeah, different distributions yeah, yeah. and right because privacy gives you the out of distribution yeah, yeah. um so yeah yeah good point yeah no i hadn't made that connection that's cool yeah Yeah, because because again, I, I, it feels like part of the problem in uh, re reproducibility in the world is the you know I, I don't know how to generate your your distribution right. You're sampling from folks folks around campus in, uh, in UCSD. I'm sampling from you know folks around Stanford if I'm doing some test on students or something, right? So yeah, yeah, I hate you. Samples aren't real. I do, there you <laughs> Distributions go. aren't real. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I definitely, I, I want to look into this very badly because this has sort of been like a nagging thing in, in doing all this work. I was like, oh, I think this could be, could be really cool, but there are all these strong assumptions that we need on, like, right, like these strong distributional, or in, yeah, in terms of like the various applications, it seems like we, we really want to be able to say something other than um, you have two samples that came from the same distribution. Um, Yeah, and also, it has other things that I guess I didn't put on the future work, but stuff that I think would be cool to look into, um, right, are questions about distribution shift and connections to reproducibility and also robustness. Because um, again, it seems like there should be some sort of connection there there as well. Um, I'm not sure what like the right notion of robustness would be, but. So it looks like you've exhausted the questions from the audience. So thanks again, Jess, for a, a great uh, enlightening talk. Thank you all very much. It was fun. Yeah, and for those of you watching very much. or uh, looking for a talk in a couple of weeks, see you maybe in two weeks for uh, Rasmus King's talk on nearly linear time max flows. See you again sometime soon.